Hello, this is uh, Dave Hearn and Dick Yarmy, the Photo Geezers, here with episode nine. Uh, today we're going to talk about black and white. And among the ways we focus attention in our pictures in, into individual areas, we can, e we can use color and our light and dark areas. And sometimes uh, those light and dark areas or the color can be distracting. And, and Dick's going to talk to you about how it shows some examples of how you can uh, overcome distracting elements and improve your photographs. We're also going to take a look at techniques of how we do this and how to make black and white images from color images while using the underlying tones of the individual colors to direct attention. It's like I said, going to start with some examples. I'm going to then talk about some terms and color fundamentals. And then Dick will demonstrate online some black and white conversions. I need to add that ep this episode will focus on desktop programs. And then in episode 10, we're going to be covering smartphones and mobile apps. So uh, those of you who only use your, your, your smartphones and notebooks, don't be disappointed because we're going to address your needs also. But we just thought it'd be easier to break it up into two segments and start with, with uh, what is probably a little bit easier is to present how you do it on desktop. So Dick, you want to take it over? Sure. Okay. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd want to mention, and I guess it's kind of a disclaimer, is that the way I look at uh, black and white conversion is that the, what, what I feel about it and what I'm going to try to translate to you is that it is opinion and it's preference. You know, they're not rules. It's not something I think you're going to learn in an art school. So this is what you want to do. And I, I kind of I call that refining your vision. And what I'll do is give you some examples of some black and white stuff that uh, I've done uh, by having a preferential reason for doing it. I'm going to share my screen. I have to get rid of this. How do I get it? David, I, got, I still look like I'm sharing. There we go. And my very first example uh, would be I, I'm in the house and I, I see my wife waking from a nap and, and uh, in thought, and, but it's not a very dramatic lighting situation. In, in color, this picture is, is kind of bland and washed out. And what I want to do is simulate a style. I've always enjoyed the style of the uh, still photographers of the 40s that worked in Hollywood. You know, George Harrell would have been an example. And they had a blooming key light, you know, that lit the face and highlighted the hair and everything else kind of went to darkness. And I was able to do that by making this black and white. Uh, another example would be just walking in the street. I don't understand why that's, here we go. Uh, uh, walking in the street and seeing a mannequin in a store window, again, the, all the massive reflections, there isn't anything that jumps out at the picture, but by making it more graphic, a very stark black and white. I think I was able to make more of a photograph of a mannequin. Another good example from street photography, uh, the, the lady's red jumper and, and the purple knapsack obviously got my attention walking down the street. But that's not, to me, that was not the picture. The picture was the expression on the young man's face and uh, the way that he had embraced the young lady. And by cropping in so that the face is larger first, but then get rid of the distractions. The red uh, blouse was a distraction, as was the purple track. Now, I believe your eye immediately goes to his interlocked hands or his face, you know, and then you then you get the feeling of the picture that I was interested in shooting. Uh, another street example, uh, a subway in New York horrible fluorescent lighting, it's flat, there's nothing to it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the pink uh, messenger bag uh, becomes the center of attention. What got my attention was the body language in the hands. So you crop in and I've got a little better rendition of that, but I'm still feel you're very distracted by the messenger bag. In black and white, now to me, my eye goes to his uh, left hand 
and the contours of it. And then you start to see the embracing of her arms and hands. And to me, that's the picture I was trying to take. Here's an example you might run into with your own work. Maybe you shoot one of your friends. You shoot, you're sitting in a restaurant and you just pick up your phone and you take a shot of your friend. Well, Ernie is a good friend. I'd like to have a good picture of him. And this doesn't, because of the lighting of the Bavarian restaurant in downtown, it doesn't really do him justice. You don't see the strength and character that I think of when I think of Ernie. By going to black and white, maybe a little more of an unusual crop, and I always looked at this as like the back of a book jacket type picture, I can get more of the feeling I get when I look at Ernie uh, and, and the feelings I have for him and the way that the things he shared with me, uh, I get it more in a black and white picture. One more example, uh, again, a snapshot of my wife, very pastel, uh, actually because the brightness of it, the, the blue of her, uh, T-shirt has gets more attention than anything else. <clears throat> I felt by going to a low-key black and white picture uh, and accentuating the hair and the, the key light coming in through the window, I could get much more of a photograph of her deep in thought than just a picture. Last example, uh, you want to do something. You have your your mind set on making something. I had predetermined in my mind uh, a graphic uh, representation of white on white eggs with some uh, framing, black and white and gray framing. This is exactly what my camera sees because it only shoots in color. Obviously, that doesn't have the impact that, that I would have had in my mind. This is more what I had in my mind. And I, Dave's going to get into the science of this, but I used it only to get this effect I really manipulated only two things, the tones of the colors, and believe it or not, there are only two colors in this photograph, blue and yellow. Now, the yellow is because there is some room light in the room, so some of those black shadows are actually a very, 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 very dark tone of yellow in them. And the, the shade that's coming in through the window, uh, open shade, is blue because it's mostly reflected skylight. And by manipulating those colors, this is what happened. Uh, that's the end of that. I want to unshare my screen, I think, Dave. Right. And the only other thing I guess I would want to say is that your choices uh, are much easier now. If you wanted to shoot black and white uh, 20 years ago, you had to buy a black and white roll of film and load it in the camera. <laughs> and uh, if you wanted color, you loaded color. Now you are shooting color all the time, and Dave's going to go through the science, uh, and he has a very easy to understand explanation, I think, as to how you can use those colors to create uh, the feeling of a good black and white. And when I say a good black and white, it means it has rich tonality, it has good contrast, you have black and you have white, and you have as many tones in between as you can squeeze out of that camera. And the color layers of the sensor are going to help you do that after Dave tells you how. <laughs> okay, David? Yep, I'm going to share my screen now. Let me see if I can get to right. You see my screen? I do. Okay. Yeah, so let me, quickly. Okay. Um, some of this uh is material we've covered before but uh we've tried to simplify it down and, and uh get just at the terms we need to understand and i will include this particular uh sheet of terminology when i send out the, the notes uh with this the first thing tone and tone is simply the degree of dark black or light white in an image with midtones being gray. Tone has to do with black, white, and gray. Contrast is how far apart tones are. So a high contrast image has black and white separated by a large degree. Now we're gonna talk about luminance and brightness and lightness and even artists talk about value. They all are just different terms for describing tone. So if we say luminance, if we say brightness, if we say lightness, if 
to say value. Again, all we're talking about is tone, how black, how white, how gray something is. Desaturation. Desaturation simply removes you going, you, or simply means removing the color from an image, leaving only the underlying tones, the black, white, grays that are underneath the image. Now, as we go through this, and you're gonna, you're gonna see something called HSL, which stands for hue, saturation, and luminance. And again, luminance being a substitute word for tone or brightness, etc. But this is a very common post-processing tool that are on many desktop photo apps. Uh, Lightroom, Photoshop, you, those with Macs, you have photos. And by the way, Apple, always being different, calls it selective color, but it's, it's in the photos, it's in Luminar. And as I said earlier, smartphones, apps vary in their functionality and we're going to have to talk specifically about those next time and how you can approach this same technique using smartphones and, and, and uh, notebooks that have mobile apps. So let's talk about first hue. All hue is is, is the various colors on the color wheel. So you know, red is a hue, orange is a hue, all the way around the color wheel. And then as you start on the outside of the color wheel and you move your way in, imagine this is, this is the highest uh, luminance, highest tone value in, in a whole bunch of colors. So as you desaturate, you, the tone you're gonna to end up with is white. If I stack color wheels on top of each other, like we have here, so hue is moving around this circle. We're going through all the different colors around the color wheel. And as we move from the center out, we're raising the saturation of the color, how intense the color is. And then as I go from the bottom to the top, I'm going from, I'm increasing brightness or luminance or tonal value. I'm changing that. And at the bottom, it's going to be black. And at the top, it's going to be white. So these three terms, hue, saturation, brightness or luminance can completely describe a color uh, in our photos. Now, what I have here is a color strip. Uh, and what you don't immediately know is these strips have been constructed in a way to where the underlying tone is exactly the same. So even though we perceive the difference because the difference in colors even perceive a different brightness, underneath here, it's all the same tone. And to illustrate that, if I were to go in and desaturate, take the color away, this is the bar we get. Because they're identical in tone, they are identical in gray. They're identical in, in, in what, the underlying tone is, and therefore you can't distinguish between them. So now let's look at that same strip. Only this time what we're going to do is, is go ahead and do a black and white conversion. This is Lightroom and you can see my pointer up here. I'm gonna just hit black and white and that's automatically going to change the color strip into what Lightroom interprets how you will perceive those colors. That's a big difference between desaturating and most black and white conversions that different apps do is they built in this idea, this intelligence is that we perceive these colors differently. So now. Go ahead and do a desaturation of the same strip, Dave. Uh, well, I, I can't do it now. Okay. So, so here, here's what happened when that black and white conversion occurred. And I'm, I'm gonna show you the original strip and ju let's just look at blue. That's the only channel I want you to look at. What I have here is the black and white and these are all, this what's called black and white mix. This is all the, the luminance of those colors. 
the hue saturation goes away on this because we no longer have color to talk about. So we don't have hue, we don't have saturation, we just have color. So if I take this blue channel, I can make the blue blacker or I can make it whiter. If I undo that conversion, take it back to color, and I go down again to, to the HSL control, instead of just being black and white controls, I now have hue, I have saturation, I have luminance. So if I take that same blue channel, I can darken it, add black, I can, all I'm changing right now is the luminance. I can change the saturation of it. Let me, here we go. So I can remove how much blue there is or add more blue. That's fine, but let's look at a real example. So now what I have here is a picture talk, taken by uh, Buzz Yoder. And there's a couple of two or three things I'm going to say about it. Obviously, uh, we have a lot of color contrast. If I were to go up here and now change, say, purple, I can change how this thing looks. But let's say I, wanted, I want to see what it looks like in black and white. So now I'm going to go back and change this. And suddenly I don't see the flowers that well. Because the flowers and the green underneath have almost identical tonal value. They are the same shade of gray. So how can I bring back that difference in the flower? I could go back and look at that purple channel again. And now all I have is the black and white mix, the luminance channel, and I can start to brighten up the flowers. And if I go to green, I can darken the green in the background and bring attention to the flowers. Now that's just a quick look at it and you can play around a lot. I could go the opposite way. I can make the, the background white and I can make the flowers black. I can play around. But Dick now is going to take you into some uh, examples and go deeper into how you might approach this in terms of, of editing your photos. So Dick, I'm going to stop my share okay. and send it back to you. Okay, uh, here's an example. Uh, and I'll just kind of do it on the fly. Uh, I was working with window light, and this is what I saw in my camera. Nick, you're, you're not, I, I'm not seeing your, your, you're not sharing your screen. I thought I was. I'll try it again. Let me find the. Well, I can't find my. I can't find my uh, little button to share the screen. Why don't I move this out of the way and go like that? All right, this says share. There we go. We got it now. Now have I got it? Yep. Okay, I was working with window light and this is what I saw. Uh, I wanted to, I was trying to do a black and white picture and I was obviously thinking of tones. Uh, the green is so overwhelming uh, and it's going to be a nasty gray when I do my conversion. But what I'd like to get is some of the reflection and detail in that. Uh, so where we would go with this, going into develop, I do as Dave just did. The first thing I do is do a black and white conversion. And that gives me a good starting point. But as you can see, it's kind of bland and there isn't a lot in that bottle. Well, the colors that are in here are basically yellow, green, and aqua blue. And the reason I say aqua blue is blue and aqua are usually what are found in the sky, predominantly blue, but there's usually some aqua. So because green is where I'm having, looking for some detail to start with, I'm gonna to go to my green slider and I'm gonna start, as you see, when I move it, I can add or subtract those reflections. As I start to get those like about where I'd like it, 
Then I want to take a look at that blue that's coming in through the window. And it doesn't make a great change, but it makes a slight, there we go. It's more aqua than blue. You see how it's added some contrast. Now that's about as far as I can go with the color sliders because there just wasn't as much color in that picture as I'd like to work with. So the next step and the only step that's left is changing the contrast. Uh, depending on your software, you're gonna have several types of contrast. One's just a general contrast like so that you can add. And then there's uh, on Lightroom, it happens to be texture clarity and dehazing. But uh, as Dave explained uh, to me one day, they're really just micro uh, types of contrast. They're all contrast adjustments. As you add more texture, you're making a, a minor amount of adjustment in between the, the middle gray pictures. Clarity, a little more. You see it coming into focus now, how it's starting to take a greater shape. And then a little bit of dehazing, and I can sharpen it up. If I wanna keep it soft focus, because I was trying to emulate a photographer of the 1800s or so, Josef uh, Sudek. Uh, color film hadn't been invented yet. So if I'm gonna be inspired by his work, I'm gonna have to do this in black and white. And that's what I was looking for. So there is a, a rough, quick conversion of that green picture. Whoops, why is it not? I want to get back to the There's the, there's the difference. All right, now give me a, let's go to a much more colorful example. Now this is a picture still working on window white uh, stuff during our uh, assignment of that. And uh, I'm actually quite pleased with this picture. I, I like how my out of date Apple worked in the red and yellow, but because my original idea of saving this rotten apple for photography was for the contrast in it and the texture and uh, although it again this was a pleasing picture to me it did not do what i wanted to do which was to show the texture and, and the look of it and what i did here now basically this has you can take a look at the colors it's got red orange yellow which you can find in the apple and then again, we've got aqua and blue because the light coming in from the right is what's reflecting off the front of that teapot. So, and I wanna bring some of that teapot out when I go to black and white, because you'll see when I do this, it's gonna kind of die. Now, I've actually killed some of the texture, which is what I wanted to get out of that apple. So now I'm gonna go to those colors and work with them. Here's red, I can brighten or darken the red. And what I'm doing is trying to build a tonal difference between the red, orange, see how it, you see the big differences and you can start to work that until by eye, you get what you want. Right here, I'll pull the red back a little bit more. And I'm doing this kind of quick and dirty, but, uh, when you do this, you can end up with a pretty decent looking, uh, and I've probably got one on here I can bounce to and show you. But watch the teapot when I bring the blue and yellow change. It's pretty subtle, but look in the middle. See how I can bring out the highlights of that? Because they're reflecting that sky. So it, it kind of helps in some of the uh, post-processing programs, you can see your color picture down on the bottom. Uh, you can probably see it at the bottom of my screen uh, if you can't remember what colors were hitting it. And on some some of the programs, you can put your cursor on, on an area and move it, and you can see the slider move, and you know what color it is, which is a great help. I think here is a, there's one that I might have considered finished, or this one. You know, they're just they just they're different. But it's all done by manipulating the color as Dave showed us. And here's one more example where there's only really one color in the picture. Uh, this was shot early morning and that's exactly what comes out of the camera. Uh, so you don't have a lot to work with. And because my vision was of a cloudscape, uh, I would think of that much quicker in black and white to be as graphic with the non-lit uh, horizon. 
So it's predominantly blue. So what I really have to work with here when I convert it, go to black and white, it's muddy. And because the only color I can really mess around with is blue, I'll take a look at blue and see what it does for me. I can make it more muddy and I can make it a little bit lighter. And if I do that, I just make sure that I don't lose the gradation, the different colors in here. Then moving to again to contrast, giving it a little texture, a little clarity, and dehazing a little bit. Up the exposure a hair. And that's about where I would you know, I'd probably spend more time with it than that, but that's about what I would end up with. Can you show them what the original looked like versus that? Oh, yeah. Hit the backslash. Yeah, but Dave, when you taught me how to do that, you didn't tell me how to remember where the backslash was. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Above return. <laughs> yeah. So you can see you've taken away the muddiness. And again, this is what I had in my mind when I pointed the camera out there. But this is what the back of the camera was showing me. Okay, does that is that help at all, Dave? Is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we why don't you unshare your screen? You know, by the time you get done with this, you're going to teach me how to use this program. Okay. There we go. There we go. So uh, that is our introduction to using what I call scene and color in black and white. That, that behind all colors are these tones and you can use those tones of individual colors to adjust your pictures as Dick has demonstrated to draw your attention to where you want your attention to go to. And, and uh, it's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, like I said, next time we're gonna, explore this on, on uh, smartphones and uh, apps there. But uh, with that, we're, anybody who has questions, don't hesitate to call us up. Uh, and we hope you uh, are able to attempt this and, and uh, maybe attract your attention to doing some more black and white. Dick? Great. I, the only thing is, remember, many of you have the ability to change what you're seeing on your smartphone or your camera to be in black and white when you start with, which is a good cheat sheet to get started with, I think. Yeah. Uh, if you have that ability with your camera, your smartphone, uh, I think if you use it, uh, you don't have to pre-visualize the colors and the tonality. It's gonna give you a, it's gonna give you the same look that Dave and I just showed you by hitting black and white in a, in a software piece. It's gonna make a, an algorithm that's gonna say, what this is what we think you wanna have. Did I say that right, David? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay. So, uh, wish everybody a good couple of weeks. We'll we'll see you in two weeks with episode ten. Have a good day. Thank, thanks for bearing with us. Bye bye.